All right, good morning. So we didn't even know we were doing song service, but it's a wonderful blessing. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Most kind Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. Father, as we're about to sing, we pray that this will come up as incense and that you will prepare the speaker for what he's about to present to us today, Father. In your precious name, amen. Does anyone have um, a song they, they would like to sing? Um, Maboshe? Isaiah 53. Say a 53. <laughs> he was wounded for our transgression. Just our hearts went up, our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. <coughs> oh, ye like sheep have gone astray, we Anyone from this section? Thank you for singing. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Good morning. How are you all today? Good. Good. So am I. I'm very thankful for the day, for the pleasant temperatures. Cool in the morning, but warm in the middle of the day. It's a blessing. I like fall in Arkansas. Uh, today, sometime along the way, you will have the opportunity to welcome the new president of OHC. He arrived last night. David Shin, Dr. David Shin, is a 1995 graduate of OHA. And so it's kind of like a homecoming for us to have him returning and assuming the role of president. Uh, he's had a variety of experiences since leaving our campus. I mean, he's been back and had a week of prayer and all, but he's had a wealth of um, pastoral experience, working with people of all ages. Um, he's a well-known speaker and he is bringing his, his lovely family is not with him yet, but they'll be coming later this week. He will be assuming the presidency December 1. We're very thankful for the leadership that Mrs. 
Rodriguez has exerted. Um, she will be, for personal reasons, reasons, has chosen to step down as president, but she'll be continuing as the academic dean and helping to spearhead the uh, work on the accreditation for the college. Academy students are taking PSATs and a form of ACT um, this morning. So we're going to ask you to be quiet when you're in the building and also when you're walking down that sidewalk um, because a lot of your conversation is heard in room six and we don't want to do anything that would be disruptive to them and their thought processes. Yesterday, um, the Academy students had a great time planting about 400 pounds of garlic for a new industry that we are beginning. Um, I'm hopeful that some of you all will help to plant the last 350 pounds. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Adner spoke to me afterwards. He said, I need help. Um, the problem is uh, we're academies in midterms and it's just not going to work to take another afternoon off. Uh, but we had everyone uh, except for one sick student out planting garlic yesterday afternoon and we had a great time. I hope you'll get some to experience some of that. Uh, we need you to be very particular and remembering when it comes to wearing masks in this building. Uh, those of you who don't have yours on, if you'll please put them on. Uh, and in the cafeteria. Uh, we, you know, the only way the college can survive financially is if there's canvassing programs. But when you come back to campus, you bring risk with you. And out of a, a courtesy for others, we are asking you to be so, um, what would be the word? Self-disciplined as adults that you set the example for our academy students and that you take initiative in being responsible in those areas. None of us like to nag. None of us like to have to come to you and tell you to put your mask on. So if you will do that automatically, Use your self-discipline, we will be most appreciative, both in this building and in the cafeteria. Today, this, we are beginning construction on our new gazebo or pavilion. Um, we're excited about that. It's a gift to us. And we are um, asking you that if you're not assigned on the work site, to stay back a little bit, especially right this, these first few days when we're going to be erecting the building for your own safety as well as to not be distracting those who are on that um, job. But we're excited about it. I know it's going to be a huge blessing to us as it is uh, finished and we can begin using it. Let's kneel as we pray. Father, this morning we're just grateful to be alive in this day in Earth's history. We're thankful for the way we have seen you lead uh, in our lives, in the history of Washita Hills College, especially we think of today, and for the many ways that you have shown us that you love and care about us. I'm thankful that you use the college students, particularly over the last few weeks, in reaching out and spreading the good news of salvation and the soon coming of Jesus. I pray that each piece of literature will find a place in someone's heart, not just in their home, and that they might be blessed and that there may be, may be many souls saved, Lord. That's the reason we do this saving those souls that you are preparing for your kingdom. Bless those seeds that are sown. 
And I ask that you will be with us now as um, Pastor Sam speaks to us, that you will guide our thoughts. And one last thing, Lord, this morning I just want to ask that you'll bless those garlic plants that will soon be coming up, that they might yield a grand harvest that will be helpful in financing your work here. And I thank you for all these good gifts. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. One, one thing I failed to mention is that, you can just stay there, there are um, blue marks up here that are for song leaders to stand on. They're 12 feet apart like what is recommended for singing. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, very good. Good morning. As you can probably tell from my voice, I've caught that which is going around campus, sore throat, um, you know, congestion and so forth. I want to make a little personal advertisement for wearing masks. I want you to imagine if instead of a, uh, whatever it is that's causing a sore throat, if it was COVID. Now think about what that would mean. It's spreading, it's spreading. And COVID would go right through us, except we become very careful about and intentional about our mask wearing. It, do I make my point? Okay, good. Um, let me get this going. <coughs> this morning, I've been asked to talk about dress. And I wanna make a, a quick disclaimer on this particular issue, um, I am not the clothing police for the campus. <laughs> I noticed that you know when I talk about you know I've, I've talked about dress before, and I noticed that um, as I go by the hallways, people start doing you know this and this and <laughs> all kinds of things as I go by, you know, kind of like they need to correct themselves, please. I'm, I'm just here because I've been asked to, to share, and I really believe in what I'll be sharing with you, but I promise you I will not be checking, so to speak, and so be at ease. That's not my job. It's not my desire. Would you pray with me a moment again? Just bow your heads. Father, <clears throat> we, want to, we want to know your heart. We want to understand things from your perspective. You who created us, beautiful, really, with these beautiful bodies, and uh, created us to be free moral agents, needing to make decisions for ourselves. And I pray that you will guide us in our thinking as we inform ourselves about this important topic. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, today, I've entitled this uh, message, The Message Behind Our Modesty or the Lack Thereof. Do you catch that? Whether you are consciously aware of it or not, what you wear, how much of it you wear, and how you wear it is sending clear messages about what you think about yourself, what you think about others around you, and what you think about your God. You can't help but send a message by how you dress. It, it's just, it's there. And what's interesting is that secular people understand that better than you and I do. Let's talk about uh, the message behind our modesty or the lack thereof. Does what you wear really matter? I want you to notice this statement uh, from Education 246. What does it say? No education can be complete that does not teach right principles in regard to dress. So if we weren't doing something to teach about this, we would be cheating you 
of a complete education. Amen? Um, and before we look at what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy have to say about this topic, let's look at how this impacts public schools. I want you to notice uh, here, this is Long Beach, Long Beach, California. You know, California kind of is out there on the leading edge of culture and so forth, right? Long Beach Unified School District, one of the first mandate uniforms, school crime decreased. When they mandated school uniform, crime decreased 36%. Student fights dropped 51%, and sexual offenses a whopping 74% increase. What's the message behind the modesty? See? All right? And then the next little thing, school suspensions dropped by 90% and reported bullying went down 78%. This is in public school, friends. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, what about out there, outside of dress? What about the workplace? Well, notice this statement, uh, several from different uh, training seminars and you know, leaders, thought leaders in uh, the workplace. The first one, the way you look directly affects the way you think, feel, and act. When you dress down, you sit down. The couch potato trend, manners break down, you begin to feel down, and you're not as effective. This is Kaplan and Legion. Well, again, some different authorities on the dress issue. The next one, Stephen Good states, uh, the findings of research psychologist Jeffrey L. Meiji that, quote, continually relaxed dress leads to relaxed manners, relaxed morals, and relaxed productivity, and leads to a decrease in company loyalty and increase in tardiness. Wow, all of this is affected simply by the way you dress? There are messages you're telling yourself and messages you're telling others by the way you dress. And the last one, it is, rare it is a rare manager who does not realize how appearance affects credibility in the workplace. Uh, the manager's desk, reference New York American Management Association. So business managers, psychologists in the world recognize the impact of dress and modesty on attitudes, morals, and productivity. Satan is certainly aware of the power of dress or the lack thereof. Um, notice this statement from 4T647, paragraph 2. Fashion is what? Deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. Now, should we be concerned about anything that would be um, separating our people from God? Well, guess what? Dress, fashion, is the great power, the top on the list here, that is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. Now, a little later, we will hear from people who create fashion design, what principles guide their creations, and what they hope to accomplish with the clothing they design. But first, let's talk about so why do people even dress? I mean, at all. Why do we dress? Any ideas? Ah, to cover up things we want to hide. OK. Um, let me put it this way, I, uh, to put it maybe in a, a slightly uh, productive way. We dress because we're seeking respect, which is quite understandable. We're trying to cover some things up and, and gain respect, okay? 
But we have discovered that clothing does not only cover our nakedness, clothing has an impact on the dresser and the onlooker as well. This is, we've figured this thing out. <clears throat> After much study, analysis, comparative research, discussion with colleagues, we might theorize that in the early stages of development, girls and boys like to dress for the following reasons. Right? Does that make sense? Like me or notice me. It's really as simple as that. As time goes by, though, and the maturing adolescent is impacted by the media and fashion industry, the reasons and choices for dressing change. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Drool. Cool. And most people in Western culture remain stuck in this mode uh, from ages about 10 through about 60 until they start dressing for respect again to hide their sagging nakedness. <clears throat> now, what is, <laughs> what is modesty? Um, first of all, let's talk about what modesty is not. Um, this is from the American English Dictionary, respected source. It says, immodesty, immodesty, lacking humility or decency. Now you notice it's talking about principles. It's not mentioning a specific kind of dress. At the root, modesty is a principle. You're either, you either have humility and decency and you dress that way or you have a uh, lack of humility or lack of decency and you dress that way, modest or immodest. So, based on all that I've studied, <coughs> here's a definition for modesty. You ready for this? Core definition, freedom from conceit or vanity. Again, you see this is principles. What's driving me? What, what is it that um, I'm really, you know, motivates me, so to speak? Um, and so, modesty would be freedom from conceit or vanity. Notice that the first and foremost modest, uh, modesty is an attitude, an inner principle of humility, self-forgetfulness, and consideration for others. So by our words, behavior, and dress, we display our confidence that we are valued by God. Isn't that something? Your value is conveyed by your level of decency. That's what you place upon yourself. Um, and how we care about how it impacts others. Immodesty, on the other hand, sends a message that we are looking for attention. We want others to acknowledge our goods, so to speak, and we want to exert influence over others with our <coughs> sexuality. That's not confidence, that is vanity, conceit, and even manipulation. So, the real question when it comes to dressing is not, how do I look? But rather, what message am I choosing to send about my heart condition? Is it humility or is it vanity? It's a different way of looking at the question when you get up in the morning to figure out what you're going to wear, isn't it? Look at this statement here, um, and boy, one O-R-H, I don't even, 10 O-R-H, Review and Herald, something like that. Yes, 11, 26, uh, 19, 14. Let believers avoid everything that approaches to pride and self-esteem. Cultivate modesty of deportment. Humility is repeatedly and most expressively enjoined in the scriptures. Peter says, be clothed with what? Be clothed with humility. What does that look like? When you look in your wardrobe, can you say, this is humility, and ooh, I better, 
Maybe I should give that to Goodwill. No, don't give it to Goodwill. <laughs> somebody else is going to know her. It's somebody else is going to wear it. Notice what it goes on to say. Cultivate modesty of deportment. Humility is repeatedly and most expressively enjoined in the scriptures. Peter says, be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The wise man declares, before honor is humility. And Jesus taught his followers that, quote, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Wow, that's the way it works in God's kingdom. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, I think if we incorporate these principles into our lives, nobody needs to tell us how to dress. We'll figure it out if we start from principle rather than starting from the point of what is fashionable. <clears throat> so, we've already looked at freedom from conceit or vanity. Number two, a little more direct, propriety. Propriety in dress, speech, and conduct. Okay? So, what I want to do very quickly, well, as quick as we can, is look at four biblical principles of modest dress. What kind of dress? Modest dress. Modest dress, okay? Um, these are, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there are Madison Avenue principles of modest dress. There are Pierre Cardin principles of modern dress, but we want to find biblical principles of modern dress. We need to hear from our designer what real modesty is. So our first and most fatal mistake in the dress issue is looking for what modern society says is modest and, what it, and that is an incremental slithering slide towards Sodom. Okay, so here are the principles. Number one, modest dress does what? Covers our nakedness. Now this comes right from Genesis, okay? Um, number two, modern excuse me, modest dress supports a clear distinction between who? Men and women. Modest dress promotes and preserves wellness, wellness. And modest dress identifies God's people and impacts our witness and condition. So let's take a quick look at each one of these. Back to number one, modest dress covers our nakedness. Um, Christ Object Lessons 310. The human body was the crown of God's creation. Can you imagine that? Every day you get up in the morning, doesn't matter what you think. What God thinks is that he implemented in you the crown of his creation. Most marvelous in design, most beautiful in form and features, and most charming in expression. God expressed his total satisfaction over his creation of Adam and Eve, declaring it very good, very good. Notice this then, it says, in their Edenic state, although God said, oh, it's beautiful, what, you know, I just, I love what they look like, okay? In their Edenic state, man and woman wore only the garment of their innocence, a beautiful, soft light, the light of God, enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. So even though God created Adam and Eve beautiful, he said, oh, we're going to put a, something else beautiful on them. And that was this garment of light. <coughs> now, it goes on to say, <coughs> had they remained true to God, it would have ever continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God 
And the light that encircled them departed. Now, Scripture says, as a result of this, that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. They knew they were naked. Now, what did they do to cover up their offense? What did they do to cover that nakedness and shame? Well, the Bible tells us. It says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves what did they make themselves? Okay, so they used fig leaves and they made themselves aprons. Now, do you know what an apron is? You know, an apron is meant to just kind of cover a little part, some little part of you. Take note, they covered up, but not too much. It may be that nakedness was proving to be, well, kind of interesting. Now, I want you to note God's response to their skimpy cover-up. What does it say? And <clears throat> unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats or tunics of skin, and he clothed them. Do you see the contrast? Either fig leaves to do a little covering up or tunics to do some real covering up. There's a human way to dress and then there's a godly way to dress. Now think about it. Right at the very beginning of humanity's experiment with sin, after losing their wonderful garments of light, Adam and Eve sensed the need to dress, but God knew that they were going to need more than fig leaf aprons to deal with the newly awakened desires of the flesh. So God wisely set a precedence for moral living by clothing them, by clothing them. <clears throat> Rather than blindly seeking to be fashionable, the question that we should be asking ourselves when choosing clothing is, what is the purpose of my dress? Notice this statement. Christians must build up the walls of modesty and virtue about themselves so that women will not, what? Allure men, and men will not, what? Allure women from strict propriety. Abstain from even the very appearance of evil. So that can be done with our clothing. Isn't that interesting? So what is the purpose of my dress? Is it to allure? Is it to accentuate my form or expose my flesh in order to get attention? Or is it to bless those around me with good taste and to protect them from temptation? Really, those are the kind of questions that we might, should be asking ourselves when we get up to dress. In other words, will I apply biblical principles in the most sensible way in, in, in my environment, or will I follow the principles of fashion and popular styles which Satan uses to exploit our nakedness? So ladies, based on the statement we read, let me get specific about your dress. If the length of your skirt exposes more of your body when you sit down than when you stand up, what message are you conveying? If the tightness of your skirt or the bust line suggests your nakedness or exposes your nakedness when you bend over, are you sending the same message? I, forgive me for being frank, but these are important questions. Now, <coughs> And guys, we'll get to you. <laughs> now, as I was doing research for this presentation, I was interested in how people in the fashion industry view the issue of modesty. And something which I knew intuitively from growing up in New York City, the fashion capital of the world, okay, <coughs> was confirmed in my research. We Christians 
are either naive or pretend to be naive about the messages that our dress sends out to people. But law enforcement people, policemen, and fashion designers are on the same page. They understand the fashion industry is inspired by the prostitution industry. Oh, did he really say that? Let me share my research with you. At any given era in history, prostitution pushes the boundaries of fashion. Here's an article by Gloss, a you know, fashion online magazine. Uh, and this article rep recognizes that day in and day out, policemen are arresting prostitutes in New York City, where I grew up, and their dress is one of the main clues that gives them away. Now, the article goes on to mock what the policemen are doing for arresting a woman who is simply being fashionable, wearing a form-fitting pea coat, skinny jeans, and platform shoes. And she happened to have made contact with three people within 20 minutes. I think that was a giveaway, but... Um, it's, and the article kind of mocks it. It says, the fashion author states her case. She says, this could be my sister, or my mother, or me. Because skinny jeans and a pea coat is like the single most popular winter outfit in the country. And you know, her logic appears on the surface to demonstrate the ridiculousness of judging people for wearing trendy clothes. But here is what the author completely ignores. When looking for a prostitute, a customer needs to know who the prostitutes are. And clothing by design sends the first message that a woman is advertising her sexuality and that it may be for sale. Do you get the point? Are you with me? The fact that most women are following trends established by prostitutes reveals a crisis in morality, not in common sense. Now, the next few slides are a little explicit, but I want to send home a point. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot determine what modest is on the basis of what is fashionable. Not this year's fashions, not last year's fashions, and maybe not even 10 year ago fashion. Let me explain, okay? Here you have another article uh, from The Independent. That's a, a UK or uh, English-based online magazine. Sex workers chic, how fashion borrows from prostitution. Now, which direction is the borrowing going from? From prostitution to the fashion. Thank you. Uh, notice the first statement here. I'm just highlighting some of the statements. The very prevalence of such images uh, as low-cut, tight-fitting, high-heeled, glitzy, furry, and sheer clothing overworked as they may be, is a testament to their durability. It is reason enough to look more closely at a position advanced by scholars and style arbiters alike. What is the position these scholars and arbiters say? That the clothes we wear or might like to wear owe a very real debt to the world's most ancient profession. What are they referring to? Thank you, prostitution, exactly. Uh, notice this next statement. <coughs> Fashion right now is influenced by hookers, says Anna Terrazas, custom designer of The Deuce, which is a TV show about prostitutes, <laughs> of all things. It is not the other way around. In a sea of eye-numbing conventionality, a maverick appearance is their signature. For someone employed on the busy streets, Chiraza says, the point is to be seen. The point is what? Is to be seen. Okay, here's another one. Uh, not a groundbreaking concept exactly. There is an untold history of the relationship between sex workers and fashion. 
said Rebecca Arnold, a fashion historian and lecturer at the Courtland Institute of Art in London. As fashion early adopters, working women, again, the street women, working women, <coughs> routinely took up what their respectable contemporaries shunned as too showy, tasteless, or new. Because after all, the, w the point was to be seen. The point was to be seen, right? Okay, one more. Tom Fitzgerald, one half of Tom and Lorenzo in Opinionated Fashion blog writes, fashion in general is always borrowing from streetwear, and it doesn't get more streetwear than hooker. Like hip hop and grunge, the look has been normalized. It's never been more respectable. Now, you don't believe this? I'm gonna show you something. You see the picture? You can only see part of the picture in the article. Let me show you. <coughs> Here are some of the working girls noted in the article. Did you catch that? These are women that were working the streets. But on a summer day at the mall, you would not be able to distinguish them from many of the moms and teens running around between Rue 21 and uh, American Eagle and J. C. Crew and so forth you would not be able to distinguish them. Did you notice the fig leaf aprons they were wearing? Yes, yes. You may say, Pastor Sam, well, why go through these articles? Why, we, we don't dress like that around here. Well, let me share some, a personal story. Having grown up in New York City, I can describe for you exactly how prostitution impacts fashion having witnessed it over the years, and what I'm going to demonstrate may come closer to home at OH. Are you ready for this? In the early 60s, as a child, yes, I go back a ways. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, walk, I'm a seven-year-old, just got back from Puerto Rico, hit the streets of New York, living in the South Bronx, kind of a rough, a rough environment. And so you'll understand what I'm saying. I'm walking with my mother on my way to school, and I notice a woman on the other side of the street. And she's kind of, you know, walking, swaggering around and shaking, you know, and doing things uh, like this. And, um, and, and what, with what it seems like a very tight shirt. And, you know, I thought to myself as a young boy, you know, mom teaches me about clothes, how to, you know, if you wash clothing in hot water, some of them will shrink, so I'm thinking, Maybe, maybe she washed her, you know, shirt in hot water and, and it shrunk on her, you know. <coughs> and, um, but, but of all things, here's what really caught my attention. She had with her, other than her, her demeanor and, you know, the, the shrunken shirt, she also had a tattoo on her calf. And that caught my attention. Uh, so I asked mom, what, what is that lady up to? Why is she wearing a tattoo? You know, we boys would draw tattoos on ourselves to look like soldiers and sailors and, you know, and so it's kind of cool. So what, what about this woman? My mother said to me, Sammy, that woman is a <clears throat> street woman. Let's just say she's not a nice woman, but stop staring at her. Well, I couldn't help but stare. You know, she had a cool tattoo on her, and, and, uh, and, and only tough guys wore tattoos. So I, I was trying to figure that out. Well, strange thing was that months later, I noticed high school girls were wearing tattoos. And, and it wasn't to look tough. It was to look cool. Now, back then, they didn't say cool in the 60s. They said to look neato. Neato, okay. They just wanted to look neato, cool. Now, sometime later, I noticed these same street women got to wearing very tight skirts as well as tight tops. And it was kind of awkward for them 
to walk. You can imagine, I think some of you know about this. Um, uh, and parts of their anatomy were sticking way out like signposts, but I figured that they must have been, you know, really not well educated. And, and so not only did the shirts shrink, but the dresses shrunk and, you know, but the next year I noticed at all the department stores that the mannequins were wearing the shrunken shirts and shrunken skirts. So I figured it must be neato. Now, by the time I was eight to nine years old, the street women were hiking their dresses up above their knees. And I, and I have to admit, my buddies and I, you know, started developing a curiosity for uh, what the rest of their legs might look like as long as their, you know, legs were on display. Now, as you can imagine, we didn't have to wait long before the girls at school started wearing what? Short skirts, too. And even though they kept, you know, yanking them down to cover up, uh, they um, <coughs> cover up themselves, when they sat down, they inevitably gave away the color of their underwear. I'm just speaking to you as a young boy. This is, you know, we're just, uh, I'm being frank, but this was just, innocence going through these stages of fashion development. It should be no surprise then that the day came when the street women gave up on skirts altogether and started walking around in modified Testing, okay, there we are. So, lo and behold, they showed up on the streets in modified underwear. They call them hot pants or shorts for short. <laughs> and my mom wasn't happy about me staring at the street women, but I wasn't worried about it because by now I knew that it wouldn't be long before everybody else would be wearing those hot underwear or summer shorts or whatever they call them. And they couldn't pick at me for staring at normal people, could they? <clears throat> well, one more thing I noticed about the street women. When winter came to New York, I noticed that even they had to cover up. You know, it gets cold in New York. Um, at least some, they had to cover up some. And uh, walking those windy streets, up and down those streets, but what did they do? Well, they put on stretchy pants so they could be bulgy and at the same time, uh, at any time, rain or shine. Because after all, the point was to be seen. Thank you. Okay, to be seen. So it kind of bothered me that my mom and aunts and sisters eventually started dressing that way because I didn't want anybody confusing them with street women. But none of the guys I knew seemed to be worried about it. Why? Well, because after all, they were just trying to be fashionable. Ladies, let me ask you, which direction are you moving towards on this scale? Now, it would not be fair to say uh, fair, unless I say something about the guys. Uh, do these men look fashionable to you? Yeah, sure they do. Um, <laughs> well, okay, some of you may quibble with that, but uh, what do they have in common? Thank you. Skinny jeans. You can't miss it, right? Skinny jeans. What are they doing? They're trying to show their nakedness, okay? Then the, uh, you know, the, the sleeves roll up and et cetera, et cetera. They have skinny Skinny jeans, tight pants, a mix of casual and formal. That seems to be, and it's, you know, the, the, what we would call random dressing. And some have even handbags. Do you notice that? At least three of them are carrying around handbags, like ladies. <coughs> Here you have, um, it's interesting that fashion is not only uh, 
may, may not only be immoral, but it also may be dangerous for your health. In this article, uh, it, it talks extensively about research that's done, how these skinny jeans, tight pants, actually affect your circulation, men especially, and ends up you, you end up having male problems because just from wearing fashionable clothing. I think we all know that intuitively. And by the way, the, hot, the, the baggy pants, not any different. It just causes problems in different parts of the, physio of the physiology. Well, let me keep going. I know my time is running out. Just in case you think fashion designers just keep putting out random clothing that have something new, to have something new and different, I want you to take a look at this ad. <coughs> this is American Eagle and their fall outfits. Now, ask yourself, what are the subliminal messages that this model is sending? What does she look like? <coughs> homeless, okay, she looks homeless. Um, notice her hair, the look on her face suggests almost that she just got out of bed, right? Maybe she rolled out of a tent or something. Um, she either rolled out of bed or is getting ready to go back into bed. Do you get the point? Clothing suggests she just got dressed or is she getting ready to undress? What about the torn jeans? What do they suggest? Well, they leave you no question because they actually tell you what they mean by the dress. Notice what the ad says. Destroy rules. Destroy rules. Rules of what? Rules of modesty, rules of decency. Destroy them. Dress like me. Here's another one, Abercrombie and Fitch. Um, w what is the weather? Can you tell from the way they're dressed? Ah, uh, you he I, I'm hearing mixed results. I heard summer, spring, okay? Notice, let's, let's be specific, everybody has a coat. Now, even the girl with, you know, the, that part of her dress is falling off, she's got a coat, too. You see it? It's wrapped around her waist. Um, the other one is wearing a sweatshirt, so, and, and then the two guys are wearing jackets, so it must be fall, right? Or, or early spring. <coughs> uh, so the guys are covered, but what about the girls? Notice... It's because the women are being exploited, exploited in this ad, okay? They're being used as bait. Um, they are bared to get your attention. Um, now, the ad, it, interestingly enough, asks a question. And the question the ad asks is, where now? In other words, they're dressed a certain way, where now? And um, the answer, is looks that go, it's very small, but it says looks that go from a.m. to p.m. back to a.m. Oh, yes. Can, they're being explicit. They are dressed for, yes, exactly. I don't think I need to say anything else. Through media and all, and, the, and at the mall, we are saturated with these subliminal messages from godless fashion designers hungry for your attention and your money, telling you you are not cool unless you wear fig leaves. Okay, I, I know my time is. Number two, uh, modest dress distinguishes men from women. Very quickly, notice here Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a garment, a woman's garment, for all who do so are what? An abomination to the Lord. Now, the argument is often put forward that men and women all dressed in skirts at that time, so what's the difference? Well, Moses would be foolish to make any comment if there weren't differences. Uh, would you agree? Okay, so there were differences. Um, and this is what the Hebrews, uh, Hebrews Moses uh, wrote that, excuse me, you would look like at that time. First of all, look at the similarities. There were undergarments that they wore, which was a long tunic or coat, and then there was an outer garment, a robe or a mantle. I think that's clear. Um, note that nobody's wearing fig leaves, right? 
Would you agree? Okay, tight or revealing clothing. And then what about the differences? Well, the woman's garments were longer. They were longer, uh, finer materials. And there were, you know, feminine touches that were appropriate. The men's were shorter, they were looser, and they were more action ready. After all, you might have to go out there and gird your loins, you know, pull up your, 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 your tunic, wrap it around your waist, and, you know, work in the garden or do, do some things, or run, or fight, you know, in war. <coughs> so they had, they dressed that way. I want you to note that even pagan Egyptians, who were not as modest, in other ways, had the same distinctions. The women are dressed with longer dresses, right? Covered up a little more, and so forth and so on. So, what about today? Should we all be wearing skirts? Well, there are modern cultures that still bear similar dress styles, but note that they maintain the same differences as well. You can still see it very clearly, same principles at work in modern in cultures that still dress this way. Please note this custom council, which is on our own culture. This is from First Testimonies 470. 457. There is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress near as the uh, their dress near as the other sex as possible to fashion their dress very much like that of men, but God pronounces it what? An abomination. An abomination. Do you want to know what she was talking about? Now this is not too long ago. So what is she talking about? What kind of dress is she talking about? Well, here it is. Here's an example of it right here. This is what's called the American costume. American costume. By today's standards, this lady is dressed as uh, modest as you, can, as you can tell, you know, as can be. However, however, um, it was being developed and promoted by spiritualists, this kind of dress. By today's standards, she would be modest. <coughs> But it was innovative in two ways that were obvious to Sister White. Notice, first of all, a much shorter dress. Did you catch that? And the use of masculine trousers, vests, the vest and other articles that were not showing part of the dress were mannish. Okay, the cut, the design were mannish. Uh, again, you may wonder why she's calling such an uh, unrevealing dress immodest and an abomination, but she explains what this attempt at cross-dressing was leading to. Here's the statement. Notice, God designed that there should be plain distinction between the dress of men and women and has considered the matter of sufficient importance to give explicit directions in regard to it. For the same dress worn by both sexes would do what? Would cause confusion and increase of crime. Do you catch those two principles? dress could cause confusion of, of the sexes and lead to criminality. So where are we now in this crossover transformation? Uh, this picture that you see, these look like pretty normal, wholesome young people. Wouldn't you agree? Yes or no? They look like pretty standard. But what you cannot tell for sure based on what you see, is what gender preference they would claim for themselves. Can you tell? No. You cannot tell. Um, are they, is, is one, are they, is there a lesbian there? Is there a gay? Is there a bisexual, a transvestite, a queer, a non-binary? Or are they all heterosexuals? You cannot tell by the dress. Over a hundred years ago, Ellen White prophesied that the unisex dress movement would lead to gender confusion, an increase of crime, and we see it exploding today as the media both glorifies and promotes sexual experimentation and, quote, equality of all types. Do you see what Satan did to get the confusion going? He confused the dress confused the dress. <coughs> Number three, 
uh, modest rest promotes and preserves wellness. And these we can go through really fast. Notice modest, avoid display, pride, etc. Economical, avoid costly garments, accessories. I wish we had more time, but we've got to keep moving. Durable, simple, quality, of becoming colors, suited for services. Uh, protect, to pr provide temperature control and proper protection. Some of you, if you want to shoot a picture of this later for you your own personal study, this comes out of Ministry of Healing, the chapter on dress. Uh, attitude, avoid weary weariness that results from the rule of fashion. It is wearisome. Efficient, avoid practices that squander time, waste energies. Hygiene, clean, sensible, serviceable. Circulation, protects limbs, loose-fitting garments, waist, and finally, body needs. A study, it body needs, climate, health conditions. In other words, it takes study to dress modestly, to apply it to your circumstance and situation. So these are supremely sensible things that, that we can and should do uh, to deal with dress. <coughs> Lastly, uh, modest dress identifies God's people. And you see, of course, the statement there in 1 Peter 2.9, but ye are a what? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. If you don't stand out, you're not one of God's people. I don't mean if you don't glare out, if you don't stand out as peculiar, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Child guidance, the dress and its arrangement upon the person is generally found to be the index of the man or the woman. We judge a person's what? Character by the style of dress worn. A modest, godly woman will dress modestly. A refined taste, a cultivated mind will be revealed in the choice of simple, appropriate attire. The one who is simple and unpretending in her dress and in her manners show that she understands that a true woman is characterized by what? Moral worth. This could be said of men as well. And I'm, all, I'm, I'm practically done. <coughs> Notice this from Review and Herald, May 30, 1871. The very dress will be a recommendation of the truth to unbelievers. It will be a sermon in itself. And we have found when we take kids to mission trips, yes, we keep the same standards that we have right here at OH. <coughs> to their chagrin, uh, at least, anyway. And, um, and yet we have found over and over and over when we go to the mission field, people inevitably that we're ministering to will say, your kids are different. We could tell right away. They just seem like wholesome, wonderful, godly kids. We even had in Cuba, we had the, 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 the youth there were so taken by what they saw that they asked for a district-wide, there were hundreds of Cuban kids that came to the central church there to talk with our kids about why they're different. They wanted to know. They wanted to know. Several hundred Cuban kids said, there's something different about you. Help us. We want to be different, too. We're going to skip this. Some questions for us today. Please think about this carefully as I say these. Number one, does your dress demonstrate that you are free of vanity and conceit? Number two, does your appearance and attitude reflect the values of one who is cons consecrated to God? Number three, does your clothing identify you as a man of principle or a woman of virtue? Number four, do you really care about others and the impact you have on them off campus? as well as on campus. And lastly, are you willing to make right decisions about your dress and conduct, even if it means going against the flow? Here's my last slide. <coughs> In conclusion, we have observed the need to turn from Satan's plan of exploitation of our nakedness and vanity 
to God's emphasis on internal beauty and responsible dress. I do not want you to leave with the impression that your body is evil. No, that's, that's not the point of this talk or that it should be hidden away. No, no. By God's design, we are indeed beautiful, so much so that in order to avoid alluring others and fanning pride, we need to dress responsibly to keep our own hearts in check and to let that external beauty point to the internal beauty. That is, if we've been putting, on, putting as much time into growing in grace as we have been in dressing ourselves. So I leave you with this final question. This side of heaven, what message will your dress and deportment give those around you? I pray that the message will be that you are heaven bound, heaven bound. Let's pray together. <coughs> Lord, we have a lot to digest this morning. I pray that the big idea has come across, Lord, that we cannot look to the world to understand what modesty is, that we need to go to you and to your word to really, truly understand how to dress, how to be modest. And I pray, Lord, uh, I know that perhaps this morning there are those right here <coughs> who are in the valley of decision about how to dress, and I pray you'd give them the courage that your Holy Spirit will uh, lovingly, firmly impress them with what is most important um, so that um, for our own sake, to be free of pride and vanity and for the sake of others so that we impact them for the kingdom's sake, not for our own attention's sake. I pray that you will help us with these decisions. Thank you for being with us today. Go with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I apologize for taking up too much of your time. <laughs>